Welcome to our show today. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Pastor Jack Redman. He's written a book, uh, several books. One of them is called Infusion. And uh, the subtitle is Receive, Grow, and Give It Away. And today we're going to really focus on growing uh, and eventually giving it away. And uh, we're delighted to have you on here today. So thanks for being with us, Pastor Jack. So uh, I'm going to read just a few sections of your book. Section 1 is Get in the Game. Section 2 is Receive. Section 3 is Grow. And Section 4 is Give it Away. I want to spend a good amount of our time today focusing uh, on growth because as I travel in the body of Christ, what I see that God is doing is He's maturing uh, His church to finish the work He sent it to do. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And He never changed His mind. So we're going to talk about how the growing process affects uh, giving it away and uh, ministering to other people. And so we're so delighted to have you. So tell us a little bit about your book. And well, Adam, first of all, I want to thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor to be on your program today and uh, an opportunity just to share what, what God has has for me to do and to share with others. It's, it's just a tremendous time. Um, the book Infusion really came about... Um, when I, when I came to Christ at the age of 27, I had no church background, I had no biblical understanding, no really uh, framework of God. And what happened to me was uh, I gave my life to Christ at the first altar call I ever heard. Mm. And I was radically, radically changed. Um, gave up drinking, gave up uh, all kinds of wild living, all kinds of things like that. And I began, I began to look at God's Word and I didn't have any, any church training. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, what I was not supposed to do, what I was allowed to do, what I wasn't allowed to do. So I just literally uh, began to read God's Word. And if it said, uh, pray for the sick, I prayed for the sick, and they, and they got better. If it said, share the gospel, I shared the gospel, and people gave their life to Jesus. And I found out that um, if, I, if I needed peace, if I was struggling with anything, the Bible says that it would give me the peace that surpasses understanding. I said, Lord, give me that peace, and I'd pray according to his word, and he'd give me peace. And I just began to just devour God's word. Pretty much every day I'd get up and just read the word for an hour, and I'd read through the Bible, through the New Testament. And whatever it said, I did. And when I did what it said, God did what he said he would do. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, literally, I, I just got involved and just totally gave my life to Christ and started living this life where God not only began to move powerfully in me, but through me. And I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be uh, praying for people without any kind of title or, you know, I didn't have any concept of church uh, government or, or a position. And when I read the, the word, it didn't talk about you needed any position. It just said, go you know, go make disciples, you know, pray for people, heal the sick, you know, cast out demons. So I began to do that. And so over the years, I got involved in, in ministry, and I love the church. I've been working full-time at Christ Church uh, for over 10 years. But my, my biggest thing is spectator Christianity. I can't stand it, okay? It's an oxymoron. Christians are not supposed to be spectators, and I get into that a lot in infusion. Can you just tell that to the, walk, the viewers here, just... Christians are not created to be spectators. I, I get into this, and a lot of the, the role model of early church, they just heard, they got touched by God, and they went door to door, house to house, face to face, and the power of God. Jesus says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And the day you're born again, you're in God's kingdom with his power, with his authority, and you go forth with it. So, and what we've done is we've created a church culture, and this goes back to Constantine, and I, I talk about it in the book, where when Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, he built these grand cathedrals and put one person in charge, so instead of 500 people going face-to-face -face and door-to-door, -door, all of a sudden you had 500 people sitting down and listening to somebody who, they became the minister, okay, instead of 500 ministers. And then over time, 
you know, it became Roman Catholicism. They took the Bible away. They took the born again experience away. And then, um, obviously, with the Reformation, the born again experience came back. The Bible came back. And I believe the end times, you're going to see the ministry of the uh, common believer come back. And the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled, not through guys with microphones, not through guys that are just on television. And I praise God for them all. And, and, I, and I want more of that, not less of that. But I want to see people go face to face, door to door, and share the power of Christ with people. And that's what Infusion's about. I just want to comment. I actually want to comment what you said about a reformation. I believe that we are in the beginning or in early stages of uh, perhaps the most powerful apostolic reformation that has ever uh, seen the earth. And when I say an apostolic reformation, uh, what I believe God is doing, and you can throw back and forth on this one, is sure. that in the, in the Protestant Reformation, first of all, we were named by our enemies. And that's not too good. Uh, that's the first thing. We we're defined by our enemies. And so that's the first problem we had. And uh, the second thing is they brought back the doctrine uh, of the priesthood of the believer, which right. is a very powerful doctrine. Now, in this reformation that we're living in now, Jack, Pastor Jack, what I really believe is that God, the practical manifestation of that doctrine is taking place in believers being able to hear from God and believers be able to receive from God, right. and believers being able to lay hands on the sick, right. uh, and believers being able to actually minister to the Lord, and, and minister, the Lord ministering through them, like you said. And so the Bible says that you know God gives uh, apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists for the work of the ministry, uh, and for the perfecting or for the maturing of the saints. And so you're a gift to the body of Christ, and... Uh, that gift is to mature other people into a place of consistent action. Correct. And uh, so I just, I really agree with you about this reformation and about the saints being equipped for the work of the ministry. And so tell us, like, how does that practically take form in a, in a local church that's growing and that's, you know, a thriving church, like, you know, what is there, 5,000 people in your church? Yeah, there, there is. Um, and I think that, I think a couple things. People need to look at ministry as something they do in the church and outside the church. Mm. And we should all serve in both at some point. Um, but some people are called more uh, towards outside of the church than inside the church, and that's okay. But everybody is called to do ministry where they work, where they live, where they play. You know, every single day we have the opportunity to share Christ with people. And uh, whether, whether it's in conflict at work or whether it's in a school system or, or wherever you go, there's people with issues and problems. And Christ, you know, came, he is the overcomer. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome it. And the first part of that is I have told you these things so that you may have peace. You know, you're going to have problems, but don't worry about the problems. And so what, what people need, people are looking to overcome their problems, and that's only done through Jesus Christ. You know, we have people all over the world, you know, they're headed to the bar, you know, they're headed uh, to, to the next date, they're headed to the, get the next car, you know, they, they're trying to self-medicate, they want to try to get some joy out of life, there's something deep inside of them that they know there's more, but it's only Christ. And, and so that's what we have to do is train people to do ministry every day, wherever they go. You see, I mean, we have this concept too of ministry like it's an official thing. A uh, minister is not a title, it's who you are, it's what you do. It's like breathing. You know, every day you eat, every day you sleep, every day you do certain things. Every day, anyone who's a Christ follower, they're filled with the Spirit of God. They should be sharing that power, sharing that vision, uh, sharing that hope wherever they go. Yeah. I mean, when we act in faith, God releases His power. It's almost like you'll, you will never walk on water if you don't step out of the boat. Sure. And so, I mean... Uh, one of the things that I, I believe, too, is a shift, uh, the renewing of the mind, so to speak, within leadership, where leadership is not just teaching people what to do, but in the kingdom, leadership takes place by example and by demonstration first. So first I do it, then I teach you to do it. One of the problems that I think a lot of teaching lacks authority is because a lot of teachers in the body of Christ are not doing it themselves and then so they're trying to teach other people to do it, but there's not really that authority to really drive it home often. Now, that's not all the time, and I'm not, you know, slinging mud at the church. I'm just saying often sure. in the culture we live in, it's like you can go to college and you can get a business degree, 
by a professor who's never owned a business in sure. his life. Who's broke. <laughs> yeah. Who's broke. Yeah. So so that's kind of there's almost a culture of hypocrisy. And sometimes honestly that does infiltrate right from the world into the church. And so I believe that that's something that God's breaking down. He's renewing our minds. You know, and when Jesus preached the gospel, the gospel came two ways. It came demonstration and explanation. And that's when Jesus was moving in the office of teacher or rabbi. Sure. And then when he was moving in an office of an evangelist, it came proclamation and then demonstration. And so the gospel uh, is the power of God unto salvation. And, and when the gospel is preached, there is signs that follow the gospel. And um, so, I mean, how does that, the, the gospel of power, how do you bring that into the context of disciples? Because with Jesus, at least through my understanding, the only way true disciples were made is through power evangelism. It wasn't the only expression, sure, but it was a very real expression. Uh, and I think, honestly, a lot of people lack boldness, and I think that a lot of people's hearts are right. But I think the issue is not the heart, the issue is more the mind. So I think the growth process really aligns the heart and the mind together. I mean, what, what do you think about all that? I, I think that it, it definitely needs to be experienced. Um, you know, and I, I'm an I'm a intellectual guy, I'm an educated guy, and Christianity is an um, intellectual faith. It, you, can, you can break it down intellectually, you can understand it, but I think that that's a hindrance at times because people stop at that intellectual understanding of things where faith and power is better than understanding and education. I, I think in terms of uh, developing people that minister, like you said, people have to minister uh, to be ministers. You know, and I'm using that word minister not as a title but as just something that we do. I know me personally, uh, I, I began serving in the local church. I was an usher. I loved ushering. I loved just hugging people, shaking people's hands, and doing all that. Eventually, that led to me, uh, you know, serving my pastor when he would pray for people. And I learned about the power of God, um, you know, literally when my pastor prayed for people. I, I would hear the voice of God say something, and my pastor would say it, and it was the Holy Spirit teaching me. I would uh, stand behind people, and I would feel the Holy Spirit fall. And then I would, the person would fall back. And so I, I understood through serving. I also uh, understood through doing. In 1998, it was the first I got saved in 1997. Mm -hmm. I remember going on a youth conference in 1998, and I was praying for people, and they were falling down. And I had no concept of why they would fall down. I was, this was totally new to me. I just knew I was praying for people, and they were falling down. And I actually remember coming back on the church van, and one of my pastors asked me, he goes, how was the trip? I said, it was great, but every time I prayed for people, they, they fell down. And he said, why? I said, I don't know. You know, and literally, I, had, I didn't understand why. It was the power of God hitting them. And so I learned that through experience. Um, you know, I learned hearing the voice of God during worship. God would speak to me so clearly during worship that I couldn't deny it. You know, one of the things, uh, the concepts I talk about is being beyond convinced. We have to get to a point where we know God is God and God does what he says and we're beyond convinced. We spend so much time in the church like really trying to defend God or trying to convince God. Like, Adam, you need God, really. Like, really, he's a good God, really. Like, you know, if you pray to him, he'll answer, really. You know, and it's, it's kind of like we present God from sort of this weakened um, place or this, this mindset that he might help you possibly if and... It's not what it is. It's, it's looking at God's Word, putting your faith in it, and walking it out. So whether you're somebody who's been in the church two days, 20 years, or whatever, it, it, it still goes back to that. Because an amazing thing happened. I remember after I was saved for about a year and a half, people from the church who had been in the church 10 and 20 years were asking me questions and asking me to pray for them. And I just thought it was bizarre. Because I'm thinking, I'm like this new kid. And I don't, what do I know? But... The reality was because I dove into the things of God, you know, um, totally just coming to church and, and not working. You know, I was working a secular job, just totally gave myself to the things of God. God, like, you know, just kind of really poured out on me, and it became very real very quick. And that's available to every believer. Sure. I mean, what you said is it almost seems like when you got saved, you were looking to be 100% all in and you were looking for something to just really dive into, 
where they're at, some people in church for a long period of time had, uh, in a sense, became apprehensive to dive fully in. Now, one of the things, too, about this Reformation that we were talking about that I see God doing is uh, the Jewish people who aren't born again yet. Uh, those people are willing to die for geographical land. Sure. Uh, Islam creates people that will strap bombs on themselves or on women and blow themselves and other people up. Sure. And they're not waking up to 72 virgins, unfortunately. And so, and the reality is now Christianity, uh, now I really believe that the Holy Spirit produces people that are really willing to lay down their life. Right. And some may die, but some may live like they're dead. Right. And so I, I'm, I'm just curious, do you, how, do, how does this, in a sense, take place in people who are doing nine to five, people who are already, we live in New Jersey, we're already too busy. Right. Uh, it's already very congested. I mean, right. the, the pace of life here is like, it's really fast. You know, I think today I had already almost three, this is my third appointment. Right. You know, so I mean, how does that come into play with all the stuff that the Bible says about growing and giving it away and, you know, your book and talk to me about that. I mean, I, I think it's a matter of what you want, you know, and I think that the reality is there's even times, you know, in, in my walk where I've grown cold, there's times when I'm too busy and I, I think that, that that's just a reality, you know, with, with a family, with working, you know, all of that. But it, 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 it's about coming back to your first love and making Christ more important than your job, your spouse, your kids. And not that all of those aren't important, but, you know, I know in my life when I put them first, my kids, my wife, my job over God, eventually that just burns me out. And I'm actually doing less. I'm doing less at work. I'm being uh, less of a husband, less of a father, and I have less God. So you lose all the way around. But when you put Christ first, it's amazing how much energy He gives you, how much power He gives you, and how much He makes you better at all those other things. And I think that it's it, part of it's discipline, um, part of it's desire, part of it's just saying, you know what, it's a non-negotiable. You know, one of the things... Um, Last year in October, God really dealt with, started dealing with me about prayer. I wasn't praying enough. You know, I'm working 12, 14 hours a day for God, but I'm not praying. And uh, just recently, I got a dog and um, a new puppy. And every day, all of a sudden, I had an hour every morning to be with this dog so that he would not go to the bathroom in my house and chew things. Okay? <laughs> so I had an hour every day. And, and then God really started speaking to me and, and saying, well, do you have this time for me? You know, and if you asked me before I got this puppy, Jack, do you have an hour a day to spend with God? Adam, I'd say, no, man, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy. I've got a wife. I've got children. I, I work full time at the church. I've got a nonprofit ministry. I write books. I speak on the radio. You know, I'm a busy guy. You know, and I, you know, and you go, oh yeah, oh yeah, you're really busy. You know what I mean? But all of a sudden, for this little puppy, I had an hour a day, and, and God, God was so gracious about it. Like, you know what I mean? He didn't, he didn't beat me up about it, but he just showed me. You know, the reality was this dog was more important to me than him. Right? And, you know, we make that face. And when I tell people that story, they go, oh, and you're a minister and all, you know. But that's how we live. It's true. That's how we live. You know, people give an you know, hour to Oprah every day. They give an hour to, you know, how many times, you know, I challenge people, how many times a day are you on Facebook? You know, adults and teens. And people are like, oh, five, six, seven. But how many times do you pray? So a lot of it, you'd be amazed at the time we have if we, if we really decide we want to grow, you know, because I think that's one of the weakness, the reason why the body of Christ is weak, we, we receive some, but we don't grow into things that we receive. So we don't have anything to give away. And I think that's why people are burnt out. People are like, I just can't do it. I just can't serve. I just can't share. Man, I'm just tired. And it's because they're not receiving. And if you keep yeah. receiving, you know, when, when I was um, playing football in college, we used to have a saying that was... Uh, uh, there's no such thing as overtraining. It's just under eating. And we would literally, we, we, did, we were on a workout program one time where we would work out two to three times a day, but we would eat eight times a day. So as long as you ate six to eight times a day, you could work out three times a day. Hmm. 
You know, so it's kind of like if you're fueling yourself enough, you can really put it out. And I think the issue is a lot of people, they're not receiving everything that God has for them. So they're not fueled up. So they're tired. But that, that goes back to that, that sort of that unfulfilling, just going through life mode mm -hmm. where you don't see God move powerfully. So you don't see God move powerfully, so you don't think he can or will or wants to. Sure. But the problem's not God. The problem's us. us. Yeah. And he wants I agree to work with that you. out. I agree with you. So when you say receive, I think that we need to, let's clarify that a little bit because, I mean, there's many ways people, some people receive sure. just through reading the Bible, some people have dreams, some sure. people uh, pray in tongues, some people do all the above, I mean, some people spend hours reading, studying, and I think those are all feasible and for a balanced spiritual diet, you should sure. receive all that stuff. We were, we're talking here about the, the posture of, of the heart. What does it look like for a mom who's, you know, way too busy, has three kids running sure. around screaming, biting each other? Sure. What does it look like for someone like that or a very busy, you know, busy professional business guy who's trying to take care of his family? What does it look like for someone like that to posture their heart in such a way that they're always ready to receive from the Lord? I think it, it's, a, it's a culture and lifestyle and atmosphere of how you live. And I think that... If you look at it, you'd be amazed at certain times of the day um, where maybe if you take, I know when I get up, what I try to do before I get out of bed, I'll spend 5, 10, 15 minutes in prayer. Just, you know, and just take that opportunity. Um, sometimes when I go to my office, before I turn the computer on, like little discipline things, I'll say, let me read at least one chapter of the Bible. You know what I mean? Just because, just before I turn my computer on, because I know once I turn that computer on and the email comes on, it's, it's over. Um, you know, times at lunch, you know, when I used to work as a teacher, when I would have a, a lunch period or, or a prep period, I, I would open my Bible, you know, things like that. I think that when we're doing our work, the Bible says to pray um, without, you know, unceasingly, to continue to pray. So we can pray when we're walking, we can pray in our cars, we can pray, whether it's praying in our known language or praying in tongues, I think it's something that we could do when we're washing dishes, that mother who's washing dishes. Have that worship music on. Have that sermon on. I think there's so many great sermons on, on a computer, on podcast. You can have that. I know I do that when I try to wash the dishes or something. I've got somebody preaching in the background. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I, I've got some worship on there. I think it's part of it. And include that. That mother with the children. Teach them the Bible. You know, sit down. Let them listen to the Word on, on TV. You know, my wife with the children, they'll listen to preachers preach on TV. They'll have worship service in the living room. So it's just this mindset that if this is important to me, I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. Um, because I want more. I want more. And God is a giver. God is a giver, God. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. If he, if, he, if he didn't hold back his son, he's not holding back anything else. He gives us peace. He gives us joy. He gives us gifts. He promises to meet all of our needs according to his glorious riches. You know, he's a giver. God is a giver, God. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're, we're in a place to receive. And uh, that's just, just, just part of who we need to be. It's not something you do. Yeah. I mean, I know for myself whether I want to have some quiet time with the Lord or I want to go on a date with my wife, I've got to turn my phone off. Right. I think I have six or seven emails coming to my phone. Right. And that thing just doesn't stop. Right. And um, the, the very things in our life that can be a blessing. Right. They can also dominate our life if we don't put limitations on them. Yeah. And I know that because I've written also some books too. If I want to write, I've got to shut that thing completely off. Right. And so, I mean, that's something. Um, another one of the heartbeat, the heartbeat of, of what we're all really saying. Uh, about posturing our hearts in such a way to receive is really a spirit of humility which recognizes your need for God in everything. And so when Paul said, you know, pray without ceasing, what he was saying, he wasn't just saying pray in tongues all day long. He was really saying posture yourself in such a way that you're in constant communion with right. the Lord. That's the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And so I think that uh, we need to acknowledge the Lord and our need for Him in everything that we do. Often we don't feel like we need the Lord until we're, we're looking at an impossibility or we're in some sort of situation that we really can't do it without Him sure. or we really need a financial miracle or we need a miracle in someone's body 
or you know your family's falling apart all of a sudden and now you want to acknowledge the Lord. And I think that if we if we are honest with ourselves and we humble ourselves, I really think that that is uh, the position uh, and we position ourselves in such a way that we become absolutely irresistible to the Father. And uh, it's like His favor and His grace, it just gets on us even while we're sleeping. And we're just increasing in that wisdom and in that favor. And uh, things start to, start to really work, in a sense, to our well-being. And even if they're not, at that time, we are learning and we are maturing through some of the harder times, you know. And I think, too, one of my favorite scriptures, Romans 8, 14, says those that are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. So part of that constant communion is, is always being led by God. In good situations, being led by God. Because uh, the biggest challenge for Christians a lot of times isn't the, the choice between good and bad. It's between good and best. Yeah. And so we have to be led by the Lord. You know, a mature Christian isn't struggling with sin. You know, they're not trying to figure yeah. out... my. Am I going to serve God today or am I going to, you know, yeah. go do this? They're, they're figuring out, God, what is, I have limited time, I have limited abilities in my own strength. Where do you want me to spend my time and focus? And that's being led by the Spirit. That's talking about the grow aspect, you see. Because um, one of the things of infusion that we didn't talk about, what an infusion is, is when you look at something and um, you see that there's something wrong with it. There's a problem, either a, a physical body or a, a machine. What an infusion is, is a purposeful injection of something into a system or machine to make it better. So for instance, you got a car with old gas in it and you put in you know, the, the, the gas uh, mixture that makes it run better. If you're sick, you get that shot of medicine. It, it changes the chemistry of the body so that you get better. And when I look at society, it's in, in need of an infusion of Jesus Christ. And the sure. question is, how do you get Jesus Christ into the culture? It happens individually when people receive they grow in it, so it's not just me talking about it. People look at us and we're asking them to be Christians and saying, you know, I want you to be like me. Mm. And I don't want to be like anybody unless I see something special about sure. them. Like, you know, and, and I think the problem is people don't want to be Christians because, you know, Gandhi said, he said, you're Jesus I love. Christians I don't like. Yeah. Because you're not anything like you're Jesus. And so we can't become like Jesus unless our mind is transformed. We're walking in his power and his authority so that we could give it away.